A cloud-like appearance rapidly grew and became transformed. And we saw before us a woman, a lady, being thus fashioned, and all the perfect rose from the floor and to the top of the table, where I could distinctly observe the configuration. The arms and hands were elegantly shaped, the forehead, mouth, nose and cheeks. The beautiful brown hair showed harmoniously, each part in concord with the whole. And only the eyes were veiled because they just simply could not be. And he respects, he discusses after one particular example. He found a writing from her. This is some of my hair. Good night. Bless you, your beloved Annie. And with it came a piece of her hair tied neatly with a bow. And a final greeting, I will wait for you and beyond in the bower of flowers. So James Curtis penned his experiences in a book that's still held in the Ballarat Mechanics Institute, Rustlings of the Golden City. People often get very occult and dark about this book, but <clears throat> as I had a student who wrote a PhD on the story, describes it, he said it's actually a love story with a woman that he never got to marry. The rustlings came from late at night, he believed he could hear the rustlings of her skirts or occasionally down the street get a whiff of her unique perfumes. The veil between the living and the dead was seen to be opaque, and the loved ones could always be seen and with us. One of the ways, of course, spirits are manifest between worlds is the tradition of the spirit guide. And tonight our spirit guide will be Annie Beale herself. And so we call on Annie Beale. Annie Beale, are you here? I feel her. With her comes a sweet perfume of flowers and a noticeable rustling of a skirt. And tonight, Annie, we would like you to show your presence. Please prove to us that you are actually here. Kellyanne, will you help me? I have here a deck of cards. They are all different, <coughs> but not special in any way. Can I please get you to hold on to them as I call on Annie? Annie, will you help Kellyanne choose a card that means something to you? Do you feel her? Try and connect. Feel the sweet perfume. Think about the card she would like to choose. When Annie Bill manifested herself, she would always bring with her the scent of flowers. So choose that card. Now do not show it to me, but I'd like you, I will take the rest of the day. I'd like you to turn the card over in a moment when I'm not looking. And I would like you to write the name of a flower. Maybe a flower that means something to you. Or maybe you get a sense of one that any feel would like you to choose. And write it on the face of the card. Once you have finished, turn the card over. And I will take it from you. Annie, Annie, I'm going to put the card in the deck. I call on Annie to please show yourself. the flower that Annie had on her coffin. I think she likes you and I think she's going to help us tonight. Thank you, Kellyanne. Give her a round of applause. Another way the spirits might communicate was, for example, through the wrappings and tappings of the Fox sisters in New York. Another might be through the use of a spirit bell. We could see a demonstration from uh, Dr. Klein. Once upon a time, in a place like this, 
many people used spirit bells in a way to show the dead was connecting with them. As we research the stories, there is always a common theme. The people who wish to lift the veil and see beyond the grave are somebody who has lost a loved one. Almost all the stories, such as Annie Beale and Jane Curtis, show that lost passion, loss and mourning for a life not lived together. Before Annie died, she and James were engaged, and he gave her a ring. Tonight, I would like to show you the power of a ring in order to bridge that divide. Would anyone be willing to lend me a ring? Maybe a wedding ring, or an engagement ring, or just something that, that means something to you. Nothing too large. I know that um, um, that's maybe a little bit light. It's beautiful. Does anyone have anything a little bit smaller? Yes, could you bring that one up? <laughs> I, know, I know I'm asking the wrong crowd for sort of subtle things. Now, this week, what was your name? Courtney. Does it have a story? Yes. What's the story of this ring? A wedding anniversary. A wedding anniversary present. It's beautiful. And I'm going to use it to tell a story about love. First of all, I'm going to put your ring in this bag to keep it safe. Now, Kellyanne. It confirmed to me the ring is in the bag. I'm going to put it here. As I begin to tell a story, I'd like to share a poem. On a hot 
Pride and joy that day, the children left. The teacher followed, worn, hot, bereft. As she stepped out into the lane, a dried out tree gave up the ghost, and down it came. Death was instant, death was cruel, as she lay out still before the school. And at the funeral, he gazed upon her freckled face. But of the dream, there was no trace. But that night she visited him in her dream. Ring my bell, he heard her scream. He went to the schoolhouse and searched the place. But of the ring, there was no trace. That night her ghost still roamed. Ring my bell, she soon intoned. A week had passed, and every night she spoke the phrase that bled his heart and made him crazed. Ring my bell. I love you so, and so to the schoolhouse he crept when the moon did glow. And he picked up the bell, and he looked inside. What a clever place to hide, the possession of an almost bride. Ring my bell, she gratefully. Spiritualism itself was also complicated by important folklore from all over the world that came here. When people immigrated to the gold rush, they brought their stories with them. One of the things you'll often find in old goldfields' properties and homes are so-called witches' nights. Characters like Mary Barrel of Ballarat who patrol the cemetery selling charms and curses and healing treatments to the poor. The trading birth calls, the amniotic sac from which a child is born, held intact, maintained enormous uh, significance right through the gold rush. It could be bought for enormous sums of money. And indeed, a child thought to be born in an intact amniotic sac was believed to have the second sight. In many cases, these still remain in old properties, such as the image here. If you want to see one locally, there's a fantastic example of Anderson's Mill on the second floor. If you can go to the windowsill. Another example of these old folk traditions was the use of soot. Typically from a church candle, they would draw symbolic images in rooftops as a way of keeping away bad dreams and imprisoning evil spirits that were believed to cause harm, or helping the souls of the dead pass on. The ones from the Mechanics Institute in Ballarat um, are likely to have been relating to the Creswick Mine Disaster of 1882. Ease the souls onto the next realm. And perhaps you could see a little example of the power of soot in folk magic tonight. It's alive like fire. Shelley, would you like to join me? <laughs> Hands. They tell the story of your life. What has happened? and what will happen. They tell the story of your life. Now, David, could you please bring me the soot? Soot is said to bring great luck and great protection. This soot was taken from the roof of the Mechanics Institute, so it has already afforded over 100 years of protection to miners. I'm just going to take a pinch here and rub the dot on your hand. And I'm going to rub it through and rub it through and rub it through. And because foot is, is alive, it has come all the way through. It has come all the way through your palm to land on the other side. And just as it is lucky to, have, to shake hands with a chimney sweep, from now, you'll be blessed with extra good fortune. Thank you.
Of course, taking people through to the other side required the assistance of a spirit guide. The role of the dead is something innately dangerous. You don't know what you'll bring back with you or what you might find on the other side. A psychopomp becomes all important. And as discussed at the beginning, many people were attracted to mediums because of unanswered questions. Some might be around deeply seated griefs. Others might be, imagine today, what was the Wi-Fi password? Where were the keys? Where was my wedding ring? So this is one place that we can use our spirit guide. I make no pretension to have superpowers or to have second sight, but I call again on the power of Annie Beale. In this demonstration, I'm going to blindfold myself, but I'd first like the eyes of the audience to check that this is indeed a blindfold. Shelley, can you see through that? Kelly Ann, just in case I'm in cahoots with Shelley, can you see through that? I'm going to blindfold myself. From now, I rely only on the eyes of Annie Bill and any information she may whisper in my ear. <coughs> David is going to go out into the audience and select some items. And with the help of Annie Bill, I will say what they are. I have found an item here. Annie tells me this item has a connection to animals. Past animals. It is vast and brown, red, a brownie red. I feel it can hold secrets and important possessions, communication, currency. Annie tells me that it is a bag. Uh, a handbag, a woman's handbag. Would you like to hold your iPhone up if you see? something she once owned herself when she was a flesh. It reminds me, it reminds her of her dear James. 
It shines like the sun and gleams like the moon. It is a symbol of love. She says, it is a woman's ring. Here we have it. Perhaps one of the most prolific examples of communication that the dead has performed, and Professor Henry Slade, was seen as a master of this craft, was the use of spirit slates. Objects in which messages could be sent from the beyond on simple shortboards. Perhaps you might see an example. Of yes. Spirit. Is Annie able to still communicate with us? She's sad, but she's willing to stay. Here is the item in question, a bucket, but not just any bucket. In true spiritualist tradition, it has been magnetized with a series of strong magnets, and therefore, it gives it the power of a portion, a porting objects. We have an empty or bucket. Now, before the show, I did ask many people to write down something that they would like to see in the bucket. And I think, from the smiles, that people have been going to challenge us. I'm going to read out some suggestions. A carrot. <laughs> Maybe the carrot from the last show? I'm not sure. A black cat. I think that would be very relevant. Dr. Water, what would the significance be of a black cat if it arrived in our bucket here, besides being very annoyed? I feel a bit sad for the cat, perhaps. <laughs> Easter eggs. Or oh, an Easter egg, a very large one. Any preference? Who wrote Easter egg? You can admit to it. Who wrote it? Certainly wasn't the Oh, of course not. Of course not. Other suggestions? A shrunken head. That would be quite fantastic. Absolutely. Now, because, because we're doing this by the book, I'm going to get one of our volunteers to choose a piece of paper. Yeah. And read it out. And this is what we will teleport from whenever we need to into the bucket. <clears throat> Kellyanne, could you please read what it says? A book of magic and an 1850 shirt. <laughs> <laughs> an 1850s shirt. Okay, that explains some of the grins. <laughs> Dr. Waldron, we have magnetized the bucket. Indeed. Let us call on Annie Bill and any spirits present here today to help us. These items must not just be taken from place, but time itself. But we are in Malden, an old mining town, so perhaps a miner's shirt wouldn't have to travel very far. Shall we see? Let's see. <clears throat> something. A book of magic. <laughs> Harry Potter and the Deadly Hallows. Now, if you wrote that, you have to be specific. If you wanted to spell a book, you needed to say so. <laughs> magic and spiritualism will interpret as it will. But a more challenging thing, from somewhere in time and space, from history itself, we have an 1850s minus shirt. Thank you.
So perhaps, is Annie exhausted after such efforts? I feel she likes these people. I feel she feels a real contact with them. And that perhaps she would like to speak further. Well, perhaps we could see what the spirit slates tell us. Spirit slates were a way for spiritualists and mediums to communicate with the dead. They would have two school slates. This is not what one used now, but at the time, this is how people wrote clear messages. They would place them together and call on the spirit. Annie, are you here? Do you have a message that you would like to share with us? Annie? Are you still here? Perhaps share something of your story. I will wait for you in a bower of flowers. And here, something else. A lock of hair tied with a bow. Thank you, Annie, for this physical manifestation that you indeed wanted to help us tonight cross the Great Divide. Perhaps one of the greatest spiritualists and mesmerists of colonial Australia was Madame Sibley. Reportedly French born, but in court she spoke privately, and in private she spoke with a thick Cornish accent. And uh, on, upon her deathbed, her uh, death certificate wrote Marie Element. She arrived in Sydney in 1867 and worked as a clairvoyant, making stage appearances in 1868. In 1871, she was in Melbourne, manipulating heads, as they called it, for packed houses. In the 1870s, she toured New South Wales and Queensland, and then did a tour of the gold fields of the colonial Victoria. In mid-1880s, she was in New South Wales again with her daughter, who followed in her footsteps, known as Zell, the Magnetic Lady. And she advertised her range of remedies for conditions such as gout, rheumatism, and neuralgia. And known throughout her career by many names, and it is yet unclear how many husbands that she actually had. This takes us to another practice of spiritualists, the skill of phrenology. Developed by Franz Joseph Gaul in 1796, this discipline is incredibly influential, leading to the very ghoulish practice of people who are condemned criminals having their heads shaved and moulded in plaster and wax for the use. So people could read the lumps and bumps on your head for signs of criminal behaviour. If you thought cruel and vengeful thoughts, you would exercise that part of your brain and your skull expand in accordance. Other parts of your mind might atrophy. Today, phrenology is condemned as pseudo-scientific nonsense, but perhaps we could draw on Madame Sibley's skills or Annie's guidance to give us an example of phrenology at work. Of course. <coughs> Here, I have a phrenology head, which is used by those of us who practice the fields to determine human characteristics. If we look closely, we see the human mind and brain is divided into sections. Constructiveness, calculation, destructiveness, secretiveness, firmness, veneration, self-esteem. Each of these correlate with a trait, a human trait. And of course, the expression to have your bumps right originates here. Now, what use is it to determine a person's value by the shape of their head? As David mentioned, it was often used with criminals. Death masks made of clay and found in many jails throughout Victoria 
were created and often wrecked by phrenologists. Ned Kelly was a very interested subject. Everyone wanted to look at his head. But phrenology, phrenology was also a type of fortune telling, a way of looking at what might happen in the future relating to your personality. Shelley, how is, how's your head feeling tonight? It wants to be read. That is exactly the attitude I like to hear. So as I have here, Dr. Walden, would you like to join me to examine a do a cursory examination? Well, Shelley, the good news is we don't think you're evil. So that would be excellent. You don't have the bumps in the right place. However, I am going to use this to read your mind. Is that okay? One. Now, as with everything, we need a base. Something objective. Something that has a simple yes or no. A right or wrong answer. To determine if I actually can. And I have the world's most boring book here. Budgeting for success. <laughs> the content matter is very dry. It is designed not to excite you, not to create any false stimulation in particular areas, but it will help me delve into your brain. What I would like you to do is look through the book and choose a word, any word, a long word. Please don't choose up or the. It's very unimpressive. And I'm going to give you a piece of paper. So supervised by Kellyanne, I'd like you to make a selection of a long word, and I'd like you to write that word on the piece of paper. It is committed, and there is no way that I can inflict my choices upon you. Remember, the volunteers are here to keep us honest. Now, have you written your word on that piece of paper? Shelley, can I get you to put the cap back on the pen and put the piece of paper just on your seat and sit on it? I promise I don't have x-ray vision. I can't get at it. Although some spiritualists do purport to have so. I just grab the book back. Now here is where I assess your head. I would like you to think of that word. Think hard. Picture it out there. Pretend you have a blank slate and you write that word on the slate. Now, I would like you to now visualise the first letter of that word. Are you thinking of it? I'm going to write that first letter down. And for the first time, I want you to say the first letter of that word out loud. One, two, three. Well, like many mediums, <laughs> I can't be completely relied on. We make no pretentious pretension that we practice an exact art. However, I also feel that perhaps I didn't get a proper assessment of the bumps of your head. Did you say M? Shelley, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? What's something that you enjoy doing? Swimming. Swimming. Something else? What was your favourite subject at school? English. Hmm. Do you work in a profession or have worked in a profession to do with communication? Yes. Hmm. What's your favourite colour? What's your favourite thing to do? Sleep. <laughs> now that confuses me. That confuses me. Because I feel that the word you're thinking of is a human characteristic. It relates to activity. I believe it is motivation. Is that correct? 
Would you like to show the evidence that that is actually correct? I believe you are someone who has motivation that will point in all the right directions. And if you're getting a lots of sleep, it's only so you can get achieved more. So I feel that it's, <laughs> oh, it's something you wish for. Maybe you're being so successful and motivated that you're actually not getting enough sleep. I understand. And if you come and see us in our spiritualist practice, we can probably prescribe something for that that will be completely ethical. And not know that at all. It won't involve opium. It won't involve opium at all. Thank you, Shelley, for allowing me that insight into your brain. It takes a lot of trust to let somebody read your mind. Can we please give a round of applause? These heretical ideas of spiritualism, while wildly popular in the late 19th century, were not unchallenged. Journalist David Blair of the Ballarat Courier lambasted what he called the rise of necromancy in the colony. Others labelled the practice devil worship and witchcraft. One opinion column in the Ballarat Star went so far as to claim, and I quote, spiritualism is the most tremendous enemy of God, morals and religion that has ever been found on the earth. It is the most seductive and thus the most dangerous form of essentialism that has ever cursed a nation, age or people. Well, you know, newspapers, let's not accuse them of hyperbole or anything. <clears throat> Perhaps a more pragmatic and escaping uh, tone, we have the work of skeptics, such as pictured here, Professor Samuel Baldwin, a professional magician who followed spiritualists and offered 500 pounds if he couldn't duplicate the same effects shown in the seance on stage. And we have here a uh, ticket from when people went to see him in Presbyterian. And indeed, we have some examples here lambasting this fundamental challenge to the eschatology of the church. Something that occupied many people's minds. One of the stories I particularly love is from Castle Lane, where a fellow by the name of Detective Black engaged in a cat and mouse game with local spiritualists attempting to uncover the tricks used in seances. On one occasion, finding a lady had secreted a bladder under her armpit from which she could squirt ectoplasm. A simple pump of her arm. Other examples involved weighing people before and after their event. But you know, is it something simple as trickery, or perhaps does someone like Amy Beale have a bit of a quirky sense of humour? Um, excuse me, we still, we still have a show, uh, Dr. Klein. strongest defense used by spiritualists to convince people of their connection to the other world was the gift of levitation. Many participants at seances described taking part in levitation experiences where the tables would begin to lift and rise and shift or people's chairs began to rock back and forth and rise in the air. I have a description here from Russell's The Golden City of such an event in Ballarat on page 62. I'll give you the quote. Soon after the writing was completed, as she was sitting quietly, she was suddenly levitated or lifted into mid-air, along with the chair on which she sat. She rose with the chair more than a foot from the floor, and both remained thus without visible support. And this is the first case of the levitation of a mortal being I had ever seen. And the fact of such an incident being accomplished astonished me. I was in a position to see the carpeted floor below her. 
and could see under the chair, and I could look over the young lady's head and I could see all around her. Do you feel you have the energy for such a thing, Dr. Fine? Annie? One more? Visualize the table twitching. Open your eyes. Open your eyes, Kellyanne. Go with it. <laughs> Move for the table. There are no wires. There's no trickery. Feel the lightness. Lightness. Kellyanne, thank you. And so, with the act of levitation, concludes our night with the spirits. And I hope you've enjoyed our evening of entertainment and edification in the realm beyond the veil. Thanks also to the Goldfields Gothic Festival with dark ideas here in Melbourne. I am Dr. David Waldron. I am Dr. Joe Klein. Sleep well. For the spirits are always watching.